Uh, so let me have a quick introduction. Our first speaker is Serena Ding. Okay, Serena is a rising senior at LaGuardia High School of Art, Music, and Performing Arts in New York City. She's also the first chair sax saxophonist in New York All City Concert Band and the founder of United Under Arts Junior Academy. She's also a winner of several international STEM competitions. Welcome, Serena. Uh, our second speaker is Tony O. Tony is a freshman at MIT. He has received uh, numerous awards in STEM <clears throat> competitions, including uh, US Physics Olympiad. Uh, he also received a gold medal uh, in yeah, US Physics Olympiad and the International Physics Olympiad, he received a silver medal. Okay, congratulations, Tony, and welcome. Our third speaker is Andrew Wu. Okay, some of our audience seem to know him. Okay, Andrew is also a freshman at MIT. He majors in chemistry and computer science. Uh, Andrew has received many awards, uh, including US Chemistry Olympiad Gold Medal and International Chemistry Olympiad Gold Medal. Great job, Andrew. Uh, welcome. So we are very glad to have them and uh, we appreciate them to take the time to talk to the younger students and share their experience with us tonight. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Serena. Serena, okay, let me stop sharing and uh, you can share your screen now, okay. Yeah, you can start now, Serena. Thank you, Professor Xiao, for that great introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, as you guys probably heard, my name is Serena Ding, and I am a rising senior at a school called um, Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Arts and Performing Arts, um, that we usually just call it LaGuardia because it's too long otherwise. And um, even though I currently go to school there, and it's in Manhattan, it's um, very near Juilliard and um, Lincoln Center. Um, I actually grew up here in Carmel, Indiana, and still have a lot of friends here. Um, I don't know, some of the parents may have seen me when I was younger, dancing as part of like ICCCI performances. Um, so I do really have a lot of roots here. Um, so just a few things about me before I get really get into my STEM experiences. Um, I'm the first year saxophonist of the New York City All City Concert Band um, and the founding president of two organizations. Um, one was my school's DECA chapter and another one is my global nonprofit called United Under Arts. And I'm also a member of the Junior Academy of the New York Academy of Sciences, which is going to be um, one of the main topics I talk about today because that's one of the major um, things I've done in STEM. And so I think some of you may be wondering like why is you know an art student today talking about STEM and like you know like why did you choose to go to an art school if you really really like STEM. So when I moved to New York City the summer before my high school year um, I had the opportunity to test into test for several different schools um, and I got into three schools that all had kind of different focuses. One was called Stuyvesant. Um, it is kind of known as the Harvard of high schools in New York City. It's the classic, very academic, very STEM focused school. Um, and its acceptance rate is around 3%. Um, and then another school I got into was more humanities focused. And the third school I got into was LaGuardia, the arts school. And at LaGuardia, it's a dual mission school, so we have an equal focus on the arts and academics, and each student is part of one of six artistic studios. And I'm an instrumentalist, I play alto saxophone primarily. Um, at this school, we're really, a major part of what we're known for is we have a lot of famous alumni, um, and our school inspired the Hollywood movie Fame. So this is, I don't, in the interest of time, I'm not going to play the trailer. This is just the trailer for the movie. So, um, and then one of the extracurricular act activities I do is play with the New York City um, All City Concert Band as the first chair saxophonist. And so 
you know, I do have a lot of ties to the arts. I participate in a lot of these activities and, you know, do a lot of extra arts classes at school. So, you know, how does that really tie in with, you know, my STEM stuff, right? So at school, um, even though I was very heavily involved with the arts, I always felt that, you know, something was missing. Um, I still really enjoy STEM and in the future, I want to go into a STEM focused career, not the arts. Um, but the problem was my school really did not offer a lot of those opportunities. We, our students were more inclined to form a major dance club rather than form a science Olympiad team. And so we didn't really get a lot of mentoring and science competitions or opportunities to compete in the sciences. So I really had to find these opportunities myself. And so even though I'm not as accomplished in terms of STEM awards as the other two gentlemen that will be speaking today. I hope that my story in particular will let other students know that, you know, even if you don't go to a school that offers a lot of STEM opportunities, there's definitely ways to get involved, definitely ways to win competitions and participate and get the mentoring that you need um, outside of school and how, and I'll be discussing today how I found that and how you guys can find that as well. So in the summer after my freshman year, I had the opportunity to intern at the Indiana University School of Medicine um, in a neuroscience laboratory. I was honored to have been invited by Professor Jin to observe and help out at his lab. Um, there I kind of, I worked with um, some other graduate students and um, undergrad students on a project that they were doing regarding neuropathic pain. So what we what we did was we used um, some software like MATLAB and ImageJ, and we analyzed the brain activity of the mice there, um, and we tried to detect like you know how neuropathic pain affects the neural activity in the mice after you know they had a surgery operated to produce that type of um, neuropathic pain in their um, in their leg. Um, and the reason why I chose to go to a neuroscience laboratory was kind of twofold. Um, first off, it was because I always kind of found the brain fascinating and like how we make decisions and what affects the decisions that we make. And the other part was kind of tying back to music and the arts. Um, I've always really been curious about the intersection of the arts and STEM and particularly once um, my grandmother um, contracted early onset Alzheimer's disease, a neurodegenerative condition that um, is most known for destroying people's memories. Um, I found I watched this documentary on, you know, how music can help people can help people with dementia and other related um, conditions with their memories and help them bring back those memories. So I became very very fascinated by neuroscience, also in part because of this association. Um, and I'll talk a little more about how like you can find other connections with STEM through unconventional means like the arts um, for more towards the end of the presentation. Um, and then as I was also, you know, during the summer, I was also constantly looking for other opportunities to get mentoring and to get um, opportunities to compete because, um, you know, my school didn't really offer that to me. I would you know, kind of have to find mentorship and competitions elsewhere. So I find, so I found what is called the Junior Academy, and it is part of the New York Academy of Sciences. It's um, a more recent program. Um, basically, the framework is that it's a very large global community, and they all come together through their passion for STEM, and they, um, through the mentor, they get mentoring from top STEM experts from around the world. Um, and other company leaders as well. And they also, they participate in a lot of international competitions that the New York Academy of Sciences and other major companies like Regeneron sponsor. Um, so I'm gonna play this introductory video. We have 27 Nobel Prize winners on our President's Council alone. We want to make sure that kids have an opportunity to work directly with scientists to learn what it's about and how you do it. Uh, a little. Academy. The Junior Academy is a genius lab where geniuses meet geniuses. 
We are very excited to be launching the Junior Academy this year, a virtual mentoring program to connect gifted students from all over the world with leading scientists and STEM experts from industry and academia. Young students will have the opportunity to learn from top scientists in their respective fields. Scientists, including Nobel Prize winners, will no longer be just a name in the book, but a friend and a mentor. So, um, so, yeah, so like they said, they, um, they provide like this online platform where students and STEM experts and companies around the world kind of converge to, um, to the students would compete in competitions and the experts and the companies would lead their, would lend their mentorship. Um, even though it's only been around for a couple of years, it's already gotten fairly selective. Um, in my year, it was a one in 11 accept, one in 11 students would be accepted. Um, and generally speaking, so the process, once, once you get in, you um, per participate in these annual STEM competitions um, and the companies are the ones that sponsor them and judge them. And then you would form a team or participate solo in one of these competitions with your other, with other members in the organiz in the, in the academy. And you would be working under the guidance of a mentor from anywhere around the world. Um, and then if you make it to the finalists or your winner, you are invited to present at their annual Global STEM Alliance Summit in New York City. So, um, yeah, so this community in particular was very, very helpful to me in finding, in getting that mentorship and getting the opportunity to compete because, like I said, my school really didn't offer that in terms of STEM. So I had to really search outside to find something that would work for me and that I could feasibly participate in with all of the extra arts commitments I had to make to my school. Um, as part of the Junior Academy, there were three main projects that I participated in. Um, out of those three, I led teams in two of them. Um, the first one that I'm going to talk about is a competition in genomics and rare diseases. It was sponsored by Regeneron and Medidata, which are two pretty large um, pharmaceutical slash biotech companies. Um, Regeneron also sponsors the Regeneron Science Talent Search, which is a major scientific competition for high school seniors in the US. Um, so my team did make it to the finalist round for this. So yeah, so we, since my team, we were from all over the world. We had um, people from many different countries. So we communicated all online, um, had regular video meetings, and we communicated through their platform called Launchpad. And Every single team is assigned a mentor. So we had um, Dr. Catherine Wirt. She was a Stanford postdoc at the time. Now she is um, part of the faculty at a university in Texas. And basically what our project framework was, was the problem at the time that we were trying to solve was that a lot of new data from a lot of different omics fields. And when, when I say omics, I mean like genomics, meta metabolomics, proteomics, those fields, they often, there's a lot of those new data coming in, especially as, you know, we're finding new ways to solve problems in like rare diseases, like Castleman's disease. But the problem is a lot of that data is kind of spread out and it's not really centralized in one location. So, um, so what we proposed was basically this kind of framework that would um, provide a centralized database with all the data compiled into one app. And then the app would also um, have a feature for, the, for patients of rare diseases to come on and basically check off like a symptom list to see you know, what kind of rare diseases they might you know, have. Um, and then it would also connect those patients to doctors and to researchers so researchers could more easily learn about rare diseases and catalog that data in the centralized location. Um, and also if you want more specific details on the on like a specific project you can always ask me privately but just in the interest of time I'm not going to go too in depth into the exact um, methods that we used. Um, and then 
another challenge that I worked on and I led a team in was um, called the Intelligent Homes and Healthcare Challenge. And this one is especially applicable in today's world because, you know, we're all quarantined and we can't, you know, go outside. And especially for vulnerable communities and populations, they really need to re rely a lot on telemedicine and healthcare in the home. This challenge was sponsored by AstraZeneca, um, Chalmers, and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. And our proposal was um, kind of like a smart home, but with a lot more features to it. So we added things like a smart hearable and a smart watch with a lot of different types of sensors in it. And the idea is that, you know, this will help track the person's health at home and help um, alert a provider immediately if there's any changes or any problems. Um, and then Another project that I worked on very recently and led the team in as well was a project on COVID-19. Um, basically the project was, obviously we all know that COVID-19 has been very detrimental to the world right now. And it's very, it's very difficult to track a lot of the data and to make sure that you know, people are staying safe. So our framework was kind of, one was an app to, again, kind of to track the data and to make it easier for healthcare providers to, um, once they have a patient, to assess, you know, where that patient has been, where that patient has um, gone recently, who they may have infected, that sort of data. And also a robot model, which would sanitize public areas, especially places like subways and other places where there's a lot of human traffic. So, um, so before I get into like briefly just go over the application process, um, I really wanted to also talk a lot about, um, you know, why, you know, why like, you know, this is, um, not why, like what I really think a lot of you guys should take away. And it's not just that, you know, just, you know, find, find these opportunities, but also really, um, when you're working on these types of projects, especially if they're team projects. Um, you have to really learn how to cross communicate and cross collaborate, um, especially because a lot of people, you know, we worked with people in a lot of different time zones and you really have to take that into account when scheduling meetings and um, being careful, you know, not to overload someone with work. Um, and you really have to delegate the tasks very clearly. Um, so these are all really, really, you know, important to teamwork and also to fostering better collaborations with peers um, in STEM competitions and other competitions that you may participate in in the future. Um, and it's also really important to take into account other people's perceptions, especially when I was working with like on the Intelligent Homes and Healthcare Challenge. Um, a lot of the things that I may have proposed, eventually we did not end up putting into the project just because we, we also had to consider, you know, um, people from all over the world. So like my teammate from India told me, you know, some of the features that you propose is not really um, applicable in the, in, applicable in the, in India, where especially like in a lot of rural communities where they just can't get access to that kind of technology and where it's also not affordable for them. So this kind of feedback you really need to take into account. And um, you really, a lot of the times you would not be able to get if you work on just an individual project. Um, or just um, compete in a more knowledge-based rather than project-based type of competition. So, and then um, I'm just gonna briefly go over the application process. Um, the portal opens um, from April to July every single year. Um, it's on their website. Um, you can just search up New York Academy of Sciences, Junior Academy. And it's a pretty typical recommend, typical application, similar to college, I would say. Um, you need teacher recommendations, you need transcripts, essays, um, that sort of thing. Most of the essays are about, you know, what, you know, what interests you in STEM? What do you want to pursue in the future? Why do you want to become a part of this community? And you know, what do you, what are you going to get out of it, basically? And um, another competition I wanted to briefly go over was um, 
the Inter International Artificial Intelligence Fair. Um, I participated in this in early, early last year. Um, and again, this was an international team that I led. Um, this competition is sponsored by the Global Artificial Intelligence Academic Alliance. For this competition, our propose, we, our, the problem that we are trying to solve is how to recommend better books for students, particularly in the classroom setting. So we used, um, we, we analyzed several different book recommender systems. We analyzed them based on four different components. We analyzed one specifically for correlation, one for lexile levels, which is a type of um, difficulty level of the, of the book and also popularity and then content. And we mainly use the tools, um, a lot of different Python libraries like um, Num NumPy and Scikit-Learn and um, Pandas. We, used, we mainly use those to analyze the data. Um, and we just, and we, in, in the future, um, we would also like to improve the project by using more neural networks with more deep learning capabilities. Um, and we hope that, you know, as we collect more data using these um, software that we can develop a higher um, machine learning model with a higher accuracy in recommending books that are most suitable for students. And then finally, I'm just going to go over another project that I did, but it's not really a competition. Um, I mentioned earlier that the arts are really important to me and it's a really central part of my identity. And, you know, I go to an art school. Um, so I started United Under Arts, which is a global nonprofit. And even though it was very, it's very arts focused, I actually started it because I wanted to do more regarding STEM and the arts, not just the arts particularly. I was inspired by um, particularly neuroscience um, because Neuroscience is something that, you know, I participated in researching in and was really inspired to learn about because I knew how music could be used and to help people with dementia and um, connect like the different the different parts of the brain through um, through music for especially for the people with neurodegenerative diseases. Um, basically, again, it's um, our mission is to provide people around the world with opportunities and experiences in the arts. Um, and we mainly do this for like vulnerable communities like the elderly and students. These are just some rough numbers of how many people that we have. We have over 600 members across 35 chapters and all inhabited con in co continents around the world. If you want to get in contact with us, you can. Um, sorry, but basically what I kind of want you guys to take away from this, um, is that, you know, if you don't have the opportunity at school, like I did, you know, if you don't go to a really academic focused school or a really STEM focused school, um, there are definitely still ways that you can and should get involved in STEM outside of school. Junior Academy is one, you know, there are other programs out there kind of like that, um, that you could get involved with. And really just that you know it doesn't have to be very very complex what you're doing it doesn't have to be something you know if you you know because not everyone is going to be able to become a gold medalist or become a very very um, well-known researcher in high school but you know if you you know find these types of programs apply to them you know if you get in try to get as much out of the mentoring that you can with, from these top experts in STEM fields and try to really, really learn from your peers through these, through these programs about, you know, how STEM can be implemented in different ways through, you know, through um, different, sorry, how STEM can be implemented in different ways in different countries um, so that, you know, you get a more well-rounded view of, you know, the world and, you know, how STEM is applied in different fields. I think that's really um, one of the important things that I can share with you guys rather than, you know, because I can't really talk about, um, you know, getting a gold medal at an Olympiad because I don't have that experience. But um, 
you know, for those of you that are a little more normal, so to speak, these are definitely ways you could get involved. You know, you could start your own organization regarding STEM or regarding a topic that's more um, focused on another topic, but may also somehow be connected with STEM, like what I did with Unite Under Arts. Um, so yeah, that's what, that was really the main um, thing I kind of wanted to talk about today with STEM. Um, so thank you all for listening. And I guess, Professor Does anyone have a question? Okay, Serena, uh, I heard your excellent saxophonist. Uh, would you be able to play a piece for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, that's great. Thank you. So I'm not going to play a very technically difficult piece. Um, I'm probably going to play something that's a little more easy listening and um, that I hope you know some of you may have heard before. Um, so yeah. But what's the name, man? Um, it's the Pink Panther theme song. Um, the Pink Panther was a cartoon series from like the oh. 1960s. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have uh, an audience say she is a big fan of Pink Panther. Thank you for playing. Uh, all right, I, I see a question. So, uh, yeah, I see someone ask how, okay, how can I find competitions like this? Are there any ways to get involved in STEM? So yeah, so how can you find competitions like this? Um, I kind of just did a Google search. Um, I didn't really know anyone that had did these competitions before. Um, you know, most of the people that I knew that had competed were arts competitions. So I really just kind of searched. Um, I also asked some of my peers from more traditional academic schools as well, but mostly I just kind of found it through Google search. Um, I already knew that in New York there were several um, science organizations and I looked into them and I just happened to fi find out that the New York Academy of Sciences had a program specifically for um, younger for students, um, K to 12. So, and then I just saw and I saw that, you know, they have competitions sponsored by these major, com major companies like Regeneron. Um, so I thought that would be really interesting and just applied. But yeah, I would really say if you, you know, a Google search or, um, you know, talking to other students from schools, um, especially if your school isn't really a STEM focused school, um, that can help a lot. Some of them may know more programs or may have been told by their teachers more specific programs. Um, and then the second part of your question is, are there other ways to get involved in STEM? Um, I'm assuming besides like competitions, um, of course you can. Um, the way I got involved was through United Under Arts. So, um, you know, we, besides doing, you know, besides playing for the elderly, we also do research on, you know, like neuroscience and like how that, you know, how music ties into neuroscience, those types of topics. 
Um, but obviously that's just one example. Um, you know, if you don't want to found, create your own organization or join an organization, you could probably, you know, just start a club at school or, you know, try to find a research opportunity, get an internship at a laboratory or with a professor so that you can learn more about STEM. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, okay, I think we are out of time. So we're gonna move on. Okay, so our second speaker uh, is uh, Tony O. Okay, uh, yeah, MIT student, physics, uh, U.S. Physics Olympiad gold medal. Okay, Tony, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. So yeah, you can share your screen now. All right, yeah, sure. Uh, give me a second to set everything up a bit. Uh, let's see here. Right here. All right, uh, let's see here. All right, so, um, Right, so let me get started by uh, telling you a little about about me. So, um, uh, so uh, let's see here. So, I went to uh, Carmel High School. Right, I graduated in 2019, and I am currently a uh, rising sophomore in the class of 2023 for MIT. Right, and so. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about my high school experience, so I think I will contextualize that a little bit. All right, so I spent um, uh, most of my high school um, competing and preparing for the Physics Olympiad, the U.S. Physics Olympiad, and the various other uh, competitions that are associated with it. All right, so um, let's see here. Uh, among other things that I did in high school, uh, all right, I did the U.S. Physics Olympiad. I've done... Um, I've competed in uh, in the uh, math Olympiad competitions, uh, and and I've also like uh, participated in several clubs. Um, most notably is the most important to me, at least, is the is the CHS uh, Science Bowl, right? I participated heavily in there, and yeah, and and competed there as well. All right. Um, so that's a little bit about the stuff I've done in high school. So I'm going to really focus. So th this presentation is going to mainly focus on uh, the my experience with the U.S. Physics Olympiad, and it's going to, in particular, it's going to like really talk. I'm really going to talk about um, the sort of educational philosophy that I have uh, with learning um, that helped me with learning physics, basically. All right. So before I talk about that, I'm going to first talk about like uh, my physics journey, or or like how I like how I got involved. In physics and how I learned, uh, how I studied the subject, basically. All right. So I first got involved with physics um, as um, my uh, because my dad is a a physics professor at IUPUI, right? And so he is very knowledgeable in physics. So one summer, I think in um, in uh, in my uh, in the year be in um, between my seventh grade seventh grade year and my eighth grade year, my dad got a, got a group of my friends together and he started teaching us physics, right? Uh, just basic stuff, uh, classical mechanics, right? Um, the, for, a se for a seventh grader going into eighth grade, this was very challenging. Like this, physics is not a particularly easy subject, especially if you have never like seen, if you're seeing this stuff for the first time. Right. So my first time going through this subject, learning like a lot about classical mechanics, it did not go very poorly. I like I really didn't learn like I feel like I didn't I like had a very like surface level understanding. I barely understood anything. Right. And so right, but that's the thing. Um like so the but the the thing is I didn't stop there, right? So I so the years that follow, I revisit the content and revisit the content and try and like look at it with a with a new set of eyes after a short while after a short break right and so I revisit the content uh, like so after um, I study with my dad um, I started reading some textbooks about this subject right and and while I was reading sub, some the sub the um, uh, these textbooks I already have a general idea about like how these concepts play into each other 
right? And and um, and with this, when with this idea, with this idea of how these concepts play into each other, I was able to sort of see more deeply into um, well, not really see more deeply, but um, but I was able to like slow down and think more carefully about it. Right. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about like my sort of mindset about uh, when I was studying, but yeah, so I learned it once and I revisited it again. Right. So, and, um, right. And then in my freshman year of high school, right. I first competed in the, uh, in the entrance exam for the U S physics Olympiad. Right. And, um, the, Entrance exam for the U.S. Physics Olympiad is an exam called the Epicos MA exam, and um, it's a 25 uh, question, multiple choice question that's focused on classical mechanics. Um, I took it. I did abysmal in it, but by sheer luck, I passed the first. Uh, I passed the first entrance exam. I, I honestly, I like, I, I guessed my way into this thing. Right. And then when I took the uh, the national exam, the U.S. Physics Olympiad, for the first time, I um, I I like had no idea what I was doing, and I yeah I just like it was a complete wash. Right. So that was the first time. Right. Then so then now after like I made this, I passed these entrance exam by guessing my way through. I decided like okay, I'm I'm not going to I'm going to actually try to learn this and like. And like really understand what's going on, right? So, so I start. Yeah. So th this is actually the point where I started reading, started reading textbooks, and started really like being careful and and um and going through stuff. And I started studying uh, in like fairly in like uh, I studied. I started studying a lot uh, in this stuff, right? And so the next time then this rose around, right? I do better. I still barely make the F I still barely pass the ethical MA exam, but then, but then, um, taking the national exam, right. I, I study really hard for this, but it turns, but then it, then I, it, I turn up to the exam and the exam turns out to be very, very difficult. And so I, and I, so I feel like I do a complete wash of this. I feel like I don't really answer anything. I feel like I have not really done it done well, right? And so, yeah. But, but it turns out that because this exam was so hard that year, that even if, like, I, even if you don't do very well on the exam, you still do well comparative, you can still do well comparatively to other people. And, and, um, and so that year, I actually, I actually qualified for, um, for the uh, U.S. physics um, training camp, right? Which is, um, which is, which is what how they how they do this is they take the top twenty tests, the top twenty scores on this test, and they invite these people to go to a sort of camp um, to like sort of learn, right? Learn physics, and and it's also and also the other intention of this camp is to select five people to go to the international physics Olympiad, right? So I am overjoyed when I hear that um, when I hear that like my poor performance has somehow qualified me uh, to go to this training camp, right? So I go there, right? And, and there's, they have a bunch of tests and stuff for uh, selecting the International Physics Olympiad. And, and, I, and I honestly don't do that well, right? right? And so this is my sophomore year, by the way, right? And so I go there, I don't do well, and then I come back. And then I decide that I'm going to try and I'm going to study really hard and I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to make the international team, right? And so I do that. I study, I study, I read textbooks, I read more textbooks, I reread textbooks, I do practice tests, and, and then, and then uh, this is my junior year, right? In my junior year, I, I take the U.S. Physics Olympiad. I, I, I once again make the training camp, and then at the training camp, right, I once again go through a series of tests that I feel like I have failed, but but this time it turns out that that um, I actually that like like the tests at the camp were also hard and even if I have done like poor poorly compared to the test I still did well enough that I made the um, the international 
in the international team for the US, right? And so that summer, of the summer of 2018, I, uh, I, went, I went to uh, Portugal and I competed in the International Physics Olympiad, right? Where I got a silver medal, right? So that's the base, that's like the uh, wholesale, that's like the uh, context of like my experience with physics is basically I took, I took some tests, I didn't do well, and then I studied and I tried again, and I tried again, right? Right, so with that out of the way, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about like some of these strategies I use while studying and the sort of mindset I had while trying to learn this subject because, because I studied the same material over and over again. And each time, right, I sort of solidified my understanding better. All right, so let's see here. All right, so yeah, so, so the physicist Richard Feynman once said that, said something to the effect that if you truly understand something, you should be able to explain it to a bunch of elementary schoolers so that in a way that they understand, right? I have a slightly different uh, opinion of, like, understanding of this. And my, uh, to me, to be able to understand something is to be able to logically explain everything about it, All right? So one of the things that I really liked about this subject of physics is the fact that, um, this subject of, like, you can describe anything in the world with physics, right? Because physics is, by definition, the science that describes the world, right? You can take any phenomenon that occurs in the world, and hypothetically, you should be able to distill it down to physical concepts that you can, that, um, that make sense, right? That makes sense with according to the laws of physics, right? And... And this, and eventually, like, as, I've, as I was studying, this is the uh, approach that I took. I, this is the sort of goal that I, that I set myself out for in order to achieve. Like, I set, I set myself out, like, the, um, the standard that I set myself out was that, was that I wanted to learn physics well enough that I could theoretically explain, explain away anything. You can show me, like, anything like any, anything that's going on, and I would directly be able to explain why that happened, uh, under what circumstances that happened, and under what, uh, under, what, uh, bleh, under what circumstances that might happen again, and sort of like, in, and how you would like, and how you would uh, get a situation that this happens, I guess, right? So yeah, ex so, um, Right, and another thing about physics is that physics is a science that is logically built from base components, right? If you know anything about classical mechanics, there are basically two sentences that sum up everything you need to know about classical mechanics. And, um, and from those two sentences, you can derive anything in that subject. So what I set out my what I set out to do was I set out to try to explain explain every single physical concept from those two different those two those two concepts those two concepts by the way are Newton's second and third law I'm not going to uh, trouble you guys with the details about that but well, that's the idea is that I try to I try to develop an under, an understanding that um, that I in a way in such a way that I could directly explain anything in the subject, right? So that's, that was, that's, this is the goal that I set myself out to achieve, right? So how did I try to achieve it is I played the devil, devil's advocate with myself, right? So I, I developed an understanding of what's going on in this thing. I have an idea of what's going on, right? I've went, so like I said before, like in my little thing about my, how I learned physics is that I learned the same material over and over again, right? But each time I learned the material, what I did was I tried to poke holes in my understanding. I tried to poke holes in my understanding by playing the devil's advocate, right? So like I said before, like physics, like classical mechanics can be distilled down to two basic concepts, right? And you can theoretically derive class, anything in classical mechanics by using logical arguments from those two concepts. Right. What I would try to do is that when I try to build this, log this, this, um, this logical argument, I would try to tear it down by playing the devil's advocate. Right. I would try to introduce, like, try to think up of situations that would contradict these 
this sort of logical argument I was making. And that would contradict my sort of worldview of physics, right? And this process of trying to search out for, um, trying to prove myself wrong was, um, was um, the, way, the main way that I really solidified my understanding. Because when you're trying to actively prove yourself wrong, well, when you're trying to prove anything wrong, you generally look at the details of what's going on, the, very, the, very nuan the, the small nuances that are going on. And so by trying to actively disprove my own, my own understanding, right, I would, I would gain something out of it. I would gain, I would gain like understanding of these small details that like that could can, can like that I that originally led to contradictions, right? But then, but then upon examining these contradictions, I learned about these smaller details, and I had a more solid understanding of physics. And this is what um, helped carry me through all of these competitions. All right, so. Um, if time allows, I, I prepared a little example about like this process, right? So um, there, uh, in thermodynamics, there is, um, there is, uh, there are three laws of thermodynamics, there are three main laws of thermodynamics. And this, this, the most important and the sometimes most difficult to understand um, law of thermodynamics is the second law of thermodynamics, which is also known as the law of entropy. So basically what the, um, uh, so basically, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to try to explain the law of second law of thermodynamics, right? And then I'm going to try to show you how I try to uh, try to poke holes in this argument by introducing a situation that does not necessarily gel with this explanation, this uh, this law of this um, this law of physics, right? So the second law of thermodynamics is um, the statement that entropy must always increase, and entropy if you don't know what it is, is a general statement of like disorder in the universe, right? So, right, basically the statement is that disorder must always increase. And the main, uh, the main thing that I want to bring into your attention is that um, if you take like some, like, uh, like uh, a parcel of like gas, right? And then you, and you have it in this small container and then if, when you open this container, what's going to happen is that this gas is going to expand and it's going to fill the room. Right? And the reason that it does this is because when this gas is in this small container, it's more orderly than when it's in this very large room. Right? So, right, so this, is a, this is a process, this is a law that holds true for everything. It's the reason why... Uh, what, why, when we have something that something that's hot in a cold room, the energy flows. The energy of heat goes from the hot thing to the cold thing. It's going. Heat's going to leak from the hot thing, and goes out to the cold thing. It's also why when we mix like when we mix two like uh, mix two things when we mix it around or like uh, actually not mixing when we like put like a little drop of food coloring in like a glass of clear water. Um, this food coloring is going to expand outwards and expand to fill the entire glass. It's because, it's because disorder generally increases. All right, so now we have an idea of what the second law of thermodynamics is. All right, I'm gonna try to, uh, try to um, challenge this understanding of the law of thermodynamics by introducing a, a, uh, a strange setup of, a strange physical setup. And that strange physical setup is the one-way mirror. All right, the one-way mirror is like you guys probably know what this is. It's like a mirror that, like, like if you're on one side of it, you it works perfectly like a mirror. You see your ref reflection on it. But if you're on the other side, you can see through the mirror and see what's going on on the other side. Right. But the thing is that a a working one-way mirror would actually break the the law, the second law of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. And the reason for that being is because if you have a room, you have a room, and you, it, there's a bunch of light in the room. There's, two, there's a bunch of light in the room, right? And you put the one-way mirror in between, right? The light, it, the light is actually a bunch of photons. It's a bunch of particles that are bouncing around the room, right? And if you put the one-way mirror in between this thing, right, you're only allowing these photons to pass through the mirror in one way, right? If you have this one-way mirror and you have these two things, and you, Photons can only pass through one thing, 
right? You have, you're going to start with photons occupying this big room. And then when you put in this one-way mirror, the photons are, are going to naturally move from both occupying this huge one-way room into occupying only one half the room. We have gone from a disorderly system to a more orderly system, right? And this this seems like it's going to, it breaks the second law of thermodynamics. It seems like this should not work, All right? So now we have a contradiction, right? So now that we have a contradiction, we, we, we can now think about this, think about why we have this contradiction and, and try to use this, use this reason for why we have a contradiction to sort of learn something from it, All right? So why do we have this contradiction? Well, it turns out that the reason why this contradiction exists is because one-way mirrors are not perfect, right? One-way mirrors are just sort of reflective windows. That's what they are. Um, and the way that, way that one-way mirror works is that it doesn't really isolate one side or, or the other. It just, they just um, uh, let a fraction of the light through. So it's like 50% of the light passes through, 50% of the light bounces off the mirror, right? So, the reason why one-way mirrors seem like they're one way is because they are generally put between a light room and a dark room, right? And so what's gonna happen is if you have like a, if you have, if you already have a room that has a lot of photons, a lot of light in one room, and there's less light in the other room, is that there's, go, there's that one light bounces off, right? There's gonna be a lot more bounces from one side of the room. And so there's gonna be a lot more light that is let through to this other, to this dark room. Right. And, and whereas for this other side, right, when this dark room, there, there's going to be fewer light, this less light that hits this mirror. And so there's going to be less light from this dark room that enters into the light room. Right. And so as a result, um, for, this, for someone who's standing in the light room, he's only going to see, this person's only going to see the light that bounces off the mirror and, it, and it comes back to him because there's just so much more light that comes, in that, comes from that direction. Right. So now that, so, and so that is the resolution is that mirror, is that mirror, one way mirrors are only, are not actually one way mirrors. They only look like they're one way, one way, one way mirrors because they're generally put in between a light room and a dark room. Right. And so, and so in examining this paradox, right, of the fact that one way mirrors would seemingly uh, violate this law of thermodynamics, right, we have discovered something new about one way mirrors. And we have deepened our understanding of like what's going on in the world. All right. All right. And yeah, so that's, so this is actually like all I, all I really prepared for. Um, just like, so this is like an idea of, this is basically um, a, an overview of like, of like my sort of thought process as I went through, as I was learning this stuff is that you want to always okay. like challenge your stuff, you challenge your, um, Challenge your understanding of what's going on, and by challenging your understanding, you will always you will you will um by challenging. Oh, was I muted? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah, you are clean. All right. Well, uh, anyways, that's all. That's all I really have uh, for now. That's all, that's all I really prepared for. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. I never thought about one-way mirror. You yeah. gave a very good explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. There is a question. Do you necessarily have to be involved in sports or arts to get in MIT? I don't think so. If you get uh, in uh, <laughs> physics Olympiad camp, I think you are you you right. would be able to get in MIT. Right. I can talk I can talk a little bit yeah. about like about MIT and like a uh, sort of a college application process. So um, my approach when people ask me about colleges is that I would say that people have very diverse experiences, right? And so, uh, and they have access to a lot of different opportunities, right? Right, so I personally had experience with this, um, with this, uh, with, um, with Physics Olympia, but very few people at MIT have had this experience, right? Um, let's see here, all right. And so is it necessary to play sports um, to, in order to get into this college? Well, well I, would, I, would, I would say that in general, it's not necessary to do anything because, 
because MIT understands, colleges understand that people have a diverse experience. And so some people might not have the opportunity to do some stuff, right? So, so it's not necessarily to do anything into, into, uh, to get into a good college, right? That's really my point. All right, thank you. We see a student ask, uh, do you have any advice for upcoming freshmen? Uh, fresh, okay. A freshman um, to incoming, uh, Carmel High, yeah. Uh, into Carmel High or uh, going out of Carmel High into college? Yeah, into, into Carmel High. Uh, into going into Carmel High. Let's see. So well, they want okay, to so do my well. advice for, yeah. um, for, fresh, for freshmen and going to high school in general is to find something that you like doing and, and get good and do that thing that you like doing really well, right? That was, I personally found um, that I enjoyed, to, I enjoyed studying physics and I did that really well. Right. To make the most of your high school experience, just look, just try to find something that you enjoy doing and just try to excel, ex excel at that thing. Strive for excellence in that thing. Right. And that's how you're going to make your best out of your high school experience. And that's also how you're going to make yourself look appealable to colleges as well. Right. That's okay, great. Very good. Very good advice. Okay. Uh, we have a, a parent to ask. Uh, he, uh, she seems worried about uh, her... Uh, the son addicted to devices and games. So yes, do you have any advice? How, what make you stay motivated? You seem to spend lots of time on physics. How do you stay motivated and stay away from games and devices? Um, let's see here. Well, I, let's see here. This is um, an interesting question because, because I think that um, being addicted to these devices is not a, a unilaterally bad thing, right? Because um, people, so motivation is a tricky concept. Um, I have talked to a lot of people, right? And, and um, the general consensus that I get is that for someone to be successful in this sort of thing, they need to find motivation from within themselves to, to do this sort of thing, right? And, and finding motivation to do something does not mean limiting limiting your other motivations. Basically, um, uh, let me see if I can try to put this into better words. Uh, I know a lot of people who 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 play games a lot, and they're also very successful, right? Despite the fact that they spend a lot of times playing games, right? And the reason for that being is like that Dallas. is that um, the reason for that being is because like even though they spend time playing games, they always set aside time like to, to, um, to further their interests with, uh, with, like their, with like the science of choice. Um, you, can, you can ask Andrew about this uh, when he talks because, um, because he, uh, I understand that he, play, he likes playing games a lot as well. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, there are a few, still a few questions. I would appreciate if you can type the answer in sure. chat. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on. So our third speaker is Andrew. Are you here, Andrew? Hi, yes, I am. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. So Andrew is uh, oh, also a screen. freshman at MIT. He received a gold medal in US uh, Physics Olympiad and International, Phys uh, I'm sorry, Chemistry Olympiad. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, you can start now, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, I need uh, Tony to stop. Okay, speaking. yeah, I stopped. Okay, okay. okay. I'm bad. Okay, great. All right, so, um, so yeah, I'm Andrew. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I suppose, life. Um, I was thinking, like, when I got the prompt, actually, like, a week or so ago, to actually talk about this, I was kind of thinking about, like, what's the best thing I can talk to a group of, like, to 12 um, kids and maybe some parents, um, what I think could actually help you the most. And so, I mean, I, I have listened through the last two presentations. They talked a lot about, I'd say, details and specific advice. In this presentation, what I want to talk more about is about how you approach life. I think that you can always find advice from people on small details, right? Small things you could be doing better. I think what is always going to be the most important thing is how you approach life in general. It's your mindset, how you deal with things, and it's how you um, move forward. And that's why I titled this Forward, how you go through life. 
So disclaimer, actually. Um, I think that in any scenario where someone talks a lot about life and talks a lot about um, how you approach something as abstract as living, uh, you should definitely take the words with a grain of salt. And what that means is that you have to take the words that I'm saying and think about them, digest them, and then see whether or not they apply to you. I'm not like some super experienced 90 year old man. I am literally only 19 years old. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't have anything good to say. I still live the life and there are experiences I can talk about that I can draw on. And from my perspective, these are just the things I'm about to tell you are the things that I've come to believe from what I've seen through my life and through my friends. And so actually, um, I'm not really expecting that at the end of this, maybe you like totally change your mindset on life. All I ask is that you take my words and you'll think about them and you'll reflect on them. Okay, so let's actually get started on like me, what I want to say. So the first thing I guess is most important is for me to introduce myself. So about me, um, as was graciously given at the start, I am a freshman or just completed my freshman year at MIT. So class of 2023, I'll be double majoring in chemistry and computer science. I am currently doing undergraduate research at the MIT Little Devices Lab, which is a, um, so essentially we develop technology or it's helping or towards medical technology that helps um, underdeveloped countries. So if you imagine um, clients will work with are hospitals in like Spain, or Puerto Rico, um, countries that don't have um, as developed medical systems and thus they need um, advanced medical technology that can kind of help them also being at a really cheap price. And I'm also, I, in 2018 in my junior summer, I attended the International Chemistry Olympiad in the Czech Republic and Slovak Republic and I won a gold medal. And so those are all the things that if you looked at my resume, if you looked on my LinkedIn or whatever, you wherever you go, you could probably find these about me. And sure, I think to a lot of you that are here, this is probably what's important about me. You probably wouldn't listen to me if I didn't have any of these credentials, right? That's not that they're all, all there is to me. There's a lot of other things that are about me. So for example, I love to play video games. I play um, like Minecraft when I was in middle school. Um, I played League of Legends for literally eight years, I think. Seven or eight years of my life, actually. So a long, long time I've played this game. Play trading card games actually when I was in high school I went to like um, tournaments to play card games against other people and that was a big portion of my life I spent like the day I spent 10 hours straight playing card games only um, I'm a teacher so I taught some times online I teach like it, there's an awesome math summer program you can where like it's high school kids and middle school kids from across the country you can go to a campus and get like competition math instruction, so I taught at one of those camps. And I also like to play Ultimate Frisbee, so it's a sport, I like to play it. Um, fun game, whenever I see if friends, I can play it. So yeah, so like, one end, right? Um, probably, if you, I don't have the stuff at the front, I'm maybe not as important to listen to. I also think that if I don't have the stuff at the bottom, I'm also not worth listening to, because then I can't tell you I'm about to tell you. I don't have these experiences. I don't have a holistic view of how the world works. So that's why I really wanted to emphasize who I am, this box, everything I am. Okay, so the first thing I actually want to talk about um, that I think is the most important thing that helped me is reflection. And what that means, at least to me, is how you deal with failure. Because like it or not, um, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to fail. And I mean, everyone learns to cope with that different ways. And for me, I learned to cope with that. And I think that was a massive portion of why I actually managed to succeed in the end. So how do we deal with failure? Well, a lot of people, so I kind of want to address this kind of um, portions, I think, to failure. So for example, a lot of people, one of the things they struggle the most with, with failure, they attach their self-worth to failure. You've probably heard it before. You probably even thought about this before, right? thinking that like, oh my gosh, if I don't get into this college or if I don't get into this program, I'm just like a loser. I don't, I'm worthless, you know, like 
all that kind of stuff. And I think this is one of the biggest reasons people have a bad view of failure. I think that one of the most important things you can do as a person is to realize that failure should never be tied to your self-worth. That if you fail, it's just another tick on your record, it's something in your mind. It doesn't mean you're any less of a person. You'll always be the same person and you can always achieve the same thing, regardless of whether you fail. If you think about it, actually, if I did chemistry, right, and I accomplished the same thing, I studied as hard as I did, and I went to the International Chemistry Olympiad and say I didn't even score a medal, that I just got a participation prize. This would not mean I'm any worse of a chemist now than I was, or than if I had a gold medal now. Because in the end of the, at the end of the day, prize is just that, prize. Right? You don't, your prize does not dictate your experiences and your skills. Those are things you'll always have, regardless of whether you fail or whether you succeed. And so that's why I think the first thing that's most important for any person is to understand that self-worth should not be tied with failure. And I guess the, the next point is kind of similar, right? That when people fail, they despair. They get lost in the idea that if I fail, I'm never going to achieve anything. And again, this is the same problem. It's that failure should not cause you despair. I think one of the big things you can look at is that failure doesn't have to mean failure. Failure is an opportunity to also to try something else. Um, I can give a personal example. So when I was in uh, middle school, I did uh, math counts. Probably some of you are familiar with this. It's a, a math competition. And essentially the way it works is like have some kids go to some place um, like at some regions is maybe like a hundred kids in a room take some math tests, you solve some math problems, and you get a score based on how many problems you solve. And if you score high, you, you place well. And so essentially, when I was in eighth grade, so the last year of middle school, um, there's a state competition. If you do well at the state competition, you go to the nationals, yada, yada, like you know, the classics. And so in, in my eighth grade year, um, so if you get the top four, you got to go to nationals. And so I studied really hard. I thought this was important to me. I actually, unfortunately, attach a lot of my self-worth to how good I was at this math competition. And I got to the state competition, I took the test, and what do you know, I scored fifth place. And I mean, there's more than that, I guess, I, I scored fifth place on a tie. And I was at that moment where I despaired, I'm not gonna lie. I uh, got on like a stage, right, where you get your medal, and I almost broke down crying. That, that was a big failure for me. But it's not. And once you look back and once you're once I realize and once I think about it, it's not a failure. Actually, it's the very opposite of failure. Because it was a chance. The chance for me to look into myself and to actually find what I'm interested in doing and realize and to think for myself why I thought I was a failure, why I thought that fifth place was so bad. And after thinking about it, I realized that not bad. And I realized that it doesn't affect my self-worth, shouldn't affect my self-worth whatsoever. That it doesn't matter to me, and it shouldn't matter to anyone, I got fifth place that. So that's what I think is really important. It's one of these moments where, um, and this is bringing me to the second point, where stopping and reflecting is one of the most important things you can do in your life. Time doesn't stop. You know, if I stop and I take a nap or if I take a, a breather of an hour to go think about my life, time doesn't stop. But you can make your life take a break. And that's really important, I think, for a lot of people. The opportunity to stop and to take a look at yourself and to think, to understand what you've done to get to your point, where you are, and what you need to do to get where you want to be. And this is, beyond anything else, the most important thing that I did in my life I think made a big difference. It's to stop and to think to myself, look at what I've done, to look what just happened to me, and to reflect. And so this brings to me to my first point in this in this kind of sub column, to think to yourself, will this matter to me in 10 years? This actually was a, a quote from one of my best friends in middle school. He told he talked to me and he told me about this. He said, yeah, if I look at a failure, even if I look at a success, 
does this matter in 10 years? That's the exact same reasoning. Like in this middle school math competition, I scored fifth place. Does anyone care in 10 years? And I can tell you it's already been like six years and no one cares. No one cares whatsoever that I scored fifth place. That's so important to realize for anything. It doesn't matter 10 years. It doesn't have to be 10 years. It might not even matter in a couple months. This is so important because it lets you let things go. Oh, wait, um, one second. Okay, um, so that's the, next, the next point, right, is when you reflect, right, part of making failure not a failure is thinking about how can you do better. I'm not gonna lie, like, when I say failure isn't really failure, I mean, this isn't an abstract notion. There's no way to turn a failure truly into a success, right? You can't just make it what you want. The reason a failure will never be a complete failure is when you can do things like this, when that's, think about how you can improve. One of the favorite things that I like to say in middle school was that lose is improve. A simple, it's three words, lose is improve. It even rhymes, you know, it's, it's amazing. And if you think about it, when you lose, that's an opportunity. That's all it is. That's all life will ever be, is opportunities. Because you can always look at yourself, you can always find your mistakes when you lose, and then you can get better. Just like when you win, you can find your mistakes and get better. Because at the end of the day, just like with failure, you can look at a result. A result just reflects where you are now. It doesn't reflect where you will be tomorrow. and It doesn't reflect where you were yesterday. And that's what matters. How can I do better? Another thing to think about when you reflect is why is it a failure? Why do you think of something as a failure? Is it because your parents told you that if you don't get into this college, we're going to disown you? Or is it because you think that your friends won't be friends with you anymore if you don't go to the same high school as them? Because I can tell you that none of those will ever be true. Well, at least I hope they'll never be true. I really do. Um, so the big thing is to understand why things are failure. And because once you understand why you think something is a failure, you understand something about yourself. When you understand things about yourself, this is what makes you a better person. I think the best people you'll ever find are people who understand themselves. So that's why I think these three things are the most important things you can do when you fail. This is when you can reflect and you can take time and you can stop. Okay, so enough talking about failure. I kinda, it's probably nice to talk about success, so let's move on. All right, so success, question mark. Because after all that talk about failure, we really think about success in the same way. So what is success? Well, I mean, it's a word that we float around, but I think actually that very few people really know what success means. Actually, I don't think I know what success means. If you asked me when I was in middle school what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would always tell you the answer is happy. Because frankly, I don't think I know, and I don't think most people can know what success truly means. If you think success means having a trillion dollars, well, good for you. I, I mean, you can get a trillion dollars and then maybe reflect on your decision. Um, but frankly, I think it's important to, if you want to think about success, you can only really think about it in the context of a goal. And maybe if you set goals for yourself and meeting a goal of success, then sure, that's a thing to do. And so I think this is kind of leading back to reflection, is that just like understanding your failures, understanding your successes is just as important. It's really important you understand why you think something is a success. Also, you understand what you need to do from where you are, where you want to be, to actually achieve that success. Because this does two things, actually. One, I mean, frankly, it's pretty obviously, right? It gets you organized. It lets you look at your life and you can see what you need to do. Secondly, it makes you understand whether your goals are reasonable. If my goal right now is to become the president of the United States, well, if I think that's success, well, this just makes no sense, right? All of you could tell me this is a, a dumb idea. And so frankly, understanding, like looking at your goals and measuring them against where you are and where you want to be, this is one of the, another amazing thing you can do for your life because then, again, you understand yourself better. And that is crucial. Okay, and then some people might assign success as happiness and fulfillment and I mean, I guess I've more or less covered this already. Um, it's that 
you look at happiness and you look at fulfillment, it's really important to understand what those mean to you. Um, again, it's frankly that you understand yourself can be most important toward achieving happiness and fulfillment. So for example, um, I guess I can talk a little bit more about my um, experiences. So when I was in high school, I thought for a long time that getting to like the International Chemistry Olympiad um, was make me happy. It would be my success, would be my fulfillment. And I can say to some extent it didn't. Like I worked for this goal and I achieved something. And I was proud of it. Then at the end of it, you start to realize that what does it mean? And that it doesn't actually mean that much. It's an award. But it'll look good to everyone else. Happiness and fulfillment is not about everyone else. It's always about you. And so if you want to be happy, if you want to fulfill, that means chasing something that you're going to desire continuously. It's never resting. It's always moving forward. I think that's something else that's really important to understand. So last thing, just to wrap up kind of talking about success versus failure, I think it's important to understand there are two sides of the same coin. Success and failure will never truly be two distinct things. And this is true for a lot of things, and it's an important concept to understand. For example, if I did a competition, so even, for example, let's go, we can talk about the Chemistry Olympiad. You got a gold medal, and many of you, that looks like a success. But actually, if you know that like a, the International Chemistry Olympiad can award a gold medal to all of the top 30 participants. Well, then a silver medal can be awarded, I think, to maybe the top like 60, 90, something like that. So, sure, yeah, top 30 is a success. To some people, it was a failure. One of my teammates, he looked at his gold medal as a failure because he didn't win first place overall. It's things like this, you realize there's a distinction, it's not a distinction, actually, between success and failure. And you can start to understand this concept where if I placed 50 out of 100 in a competition, is that a success? Is that a failure? Who knows? More importantly, who cares? Because a success and failure, it doesn't matter, the distinction between them. It's all about what you do with it that makes it success or failure. Okay, the last like big slide I want to get to is giving advice, kind of, because again, like I said in the disclaimer, I don't know if I'm the most qualified person in the world to give you advice. Um, I guess I will start, and I think that most importantly is to finding out what success means to you. It's looking at your friends, looking at your family, looking at um, basically anything you do in your life, understanding what it means to you. For example, I mentioned at the beginning that I like to play a lot of video games. Actually, I played lots and lots of video games. I like, I don't know, on average school day, maybe play like three or four hours of video games. And I mean, sometimes my parents get mad or whatever, but it was a part of my life. Actually, I felt like that was a success because I could do my work well enough and fast enough I could play games and I could have fun. And for that, when I was in middle school, I didn't get to play games. Um, and success to me was actually a lot more focused on just doing well in a competition. That was a turning point and I failed, right? But I understood maybe my success came not from myself. It wasn't something I was doing because I was excited or I enjoyed it because it was about maybe my friends or my parents actually wanted this for me instead. And I think this was an important distinction to realize because then I understood why I didn't succeed because I wasn't immersed enough in it. And also I understood why it wasn't important at the end of the day. But I could find something that actually made me happy instead. And so that brings us to the second point. Once you know what you want and why you want it, you can work for it. Every step of the way, every time you get an achievement, every time you get a setback, evaluate. Take time to pause and reflect. This is the most important thing you can do. It's always just about reflection. It will never be easy. I can promise this. I have experience. I'm sure many of your parents have more experience than I. But what you can always do to help it make it easier is to reflect. And so that brings me to the last thing that I can give you, the most important thing, to live your own life. Um, as a meme, some people used to say, like YOLO, right? You only live once. And it's true. Do only live once. And I think it's most important that you make that once count. And that's it. I'll open it to questions.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's very great life lessons. Does anyone have any question? Okay, I see a question. How many university offers did you receive after receive gold medal in chemistry Olympiad? So, um, I don't know about university offers, but I mean, the college application process, I applied to colleges, MIT, Purdue, and Caltech. And I got into Purdue and MIT, not Caltech. I, and yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So I thought in China, you know, if you got a gold medalist, it's like all country, uh, I mean, all, all the top universities would admit you. So it's not the same yeah, case here, not. right? Okay. No, it's not the same. All right. Uh, is there any other question? What is your big username? <laughs> um, I can type it in chat later. Okay. All right. Okay. I see what rank were you? Okay, guys. <laughs> uh, okay. I see a question from a parent. Uh, how much talent does it to, to receive a gold medal in chemistry Olympiad? Uh, you know, for normal kids with normal IQ, do you think they have a chance or it's better for them to focus on something else? Yeah, yeah I think so, many parents okay. have the same question. Yeah. Okay. This is actually, I guess this is an important question I should address. Um, I've thought about this. Obviously, I don't know the answer. Um, if you think about like IQ and normal kids, these are all subjective definitions, right? Never have, you can never point to someone and call them normal kid. And I don't think that like a big portion of it is IQ or talent. Um, I think a lot of it stems down to passion. Um, even from kids that I've taught at the biggest difference I can see is when they care. It's about passion and it's about um, whether their heart is into studying it. No amount of talent can make up for someone not caring about what they're studying. And I think then that maybe to <laughs> some extent, talent wise, I can't give you end all be all answer. If you want to say a normal kid has no chance, I will definitely dispute that. I think everyone has a chance. I think if working hard enough, anyone can get there. It's maybe just a question of how much work it requires. I will certainly never ever say oh, anyone has no chance. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> do you recommend doing problems at home or learning new things as a priority? Uh, that's a question from Alex. Yeah, so, I mean, this is getting into some kind of details um, in terms of like studying. Obviously, like, I think one of the, the most important things is to realize is that it always depends on where you are, how you learn. Um, everyone learns differently. This is definitely true. Um, and I think that, for example, if you are new to chemistry and you don't know anything, in problems doesn't help you because you won't even be able to do the problems, right? In that case, it makes a lot more sense to read a textbook, start learning, or like read some video, watch some videos or something online, and to like learn new material. For others who have learned all the material, but they're not, for example, they don't have problem solving mindset, and it's way more important to start to do problems. I think actually, I, I wanted to touch on this, but I kind of forgot is that actually, um, the most important things you can train yourself is not to focus on information, but to focus on problem solving. Because these are skills that will serve you no matter what field you go into. Um, it doesn't matter, like, what you grow up into, if you become, like, a physicist instead of a chemist, you can still do well if you know how to think. I think that's something else that's important to think about. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, let me see. What is recommended age to start learning chemistry and physics? Are you offering tutoring to elementary kids? Okay, do you mind share your contact info? Okay. Um, so, I mean, I don't tutor um, elementary kids. I don't even tutor, I think I have 
I mean, I taught math to middle school kids, but I don't think I've taught chemistry to middle school kids before. Um, in terms of like recommended age, I just, I think this boils down to my answer to one of the previous questions that it's when they start getting interested in chemistry. Um, if you're giving them tutoring in chemistry, but they don't care about it, it's just wasting your money and it's wasting their time. Um, it's really about like, and if they're interested in it, get them in, get them to study in it. If they're not, you're, it's really just a waste. Okay, we have a question. How did you find your passion? <laughs> I mean, the, like as I mentioned, I, I mean, I liked math originally. I still actually like math, if I'm being honest. But I tried chemistry. I found I liked it a lot more. And it was something, I mean, if I, a little more about myself is that I hate to read, actually. I don't read books. Um, but... I actually found that if I was like reading chemistry, I could actually get interested in it. And that was kind of like a, like a sign to me, like, oh, maybe this is something I should work hard on. And I found that I actually liked working hard on chemistry. And this is how I got interested in it. Okay, yeah, I love chemistry more than math. Okay, good. So we have some chemistry lover. Okay, uh, all right, let me see. How do you like your first year at MIT? Yeah, you actually just talk about failure, desperation. So I guess when you first year at MIT, they are full of genius around you, right? Do you? <laughs> so how's your first year there? Yeah, so I mean, actually, I think it's actually true um, that if about MIT is just that there is this problem that a lot of people have. It's just like um, they call it an imposter syndrome where you feel like you don't belong, that everyone else is smarter than you because the classes are so hard that like, you feel like you, it's like a fluke that you got in. And I think this is a very common problem. I think that actually like, one of the big reasons that for my first year at MIT, I was like, be chill, you know, I went to classes, I had a good time. I got to talk with friends, spend time with friends and, you know, play games and actually do well in my classes was just that, um, so that I can, could take like maybe I could get a bad grade on an assignment or something but I could take it in stride and I can move forward from it and I can improve um so I think that like generally overall my year my first year at MIT was I mean it was enjoyable uh, certainly not the spring semester because of um coronavirus but for the most part I made a lot of good friends I had a lot of good times I think uh, that's the most you can probably ask for Okay, uh, I can. I think we can answer two more questions. Okay, so we have a question from Winnie. How do you find the balance between playing video games and studying chemistry? Yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, so a good question. I think that if I'm being frank, I don't know if I found a good balance. It was just when I studied in, I don't know, like when I was in high school and if I were studying, it's kind of just be like, if I got bored of studying chemistry, I'd just go play games. And if I got bored of playing games, I would go do chemistry. Um, I think sometimes it was just about setting my own limits, like when I felt I needed or I wanted to. A lot of it um, for me studying chemistry was self-driven. So it was just like, if I felt like I wanted to study, then I studied. Um, and this worked out for me. Okay, all right. Let me think. Uh, okay, we're gonna answer one last question. Which resources do you learn to use to learn chemistry? Uh, do you use Khan Academy or textbooks or any tutoring services or? Anything? Yeah, so when I started, I took classes from Dr. Huang. I'm sure most of you are in Indiana are familiar with him. Mm -hmm. um, he teaches chemistry pretty well. And if you're not in Indiana, he has online classes right now, so you could go teach, uh, learn from him. It was the kind of starting point. He recommends textbooks, like um, he has this like basic general chemistry textbook that you can read from. Right from that, that's the starting point, the good teacher. Um, and from there, it was just like, using the internet was a big help. Um, yeah, after I met like other people who were interested in chemistry, just talking to them, asking for resources, that was also a big help. So generally, if you're wanting to start, I would recommend, I mean, you can, the textbook Dr. Huang uses is called Atkins, A-T-K-I-N, so you can read that one if you want. 
All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, let's all thank our speakers. Okay, Serena, Tony, and Andrew. Thank you for taking the time to share your experience with us. Okay, we are very proud of your achievements, and uh, we wish you every success in your future endeavors. Uh, and uh, everyone, we are looking, always looking for inspiring speakers. So please feel free to nominate speakers to us. Okay, and uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, please uh, feel free to contact us. Okay. Uh, and I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Asian Americans Today, Ya Mei Dao Bao. Okay, and uh, that's all for tonight. Thank you all. Have a great evening and uh, goodbye. Thank you.